So, uh, I have a lot of content here, so I will go at a fair old clip. Um, my preference is actually to uh, leave as much content in the slides, because they're the things that people refer to afterwards. So, where I skip over a few bits, I'll just leave you with uh, a pointer to what I was thinking, and hopefully that will give you a place to jump off from to go and um, investigate further in your own time. Right, hello, I am Andrew Martin, uh, a technical milliner by this stage. You could say I'm a build fanatic and an advocate of continuous everything. I'm a founder at Control Plane, continuous infrastructure and Kubernetes security practices focused on containers, of course, and I've done a little bit of everything from database administration through operations, development, testing, penetration testing, architecture, and I would like to talk about Kubernetes and network security. So, right, what we want to know is, is this Kubernetes cluster secure? We need to know the state of our systems, its performance, veracity, the load it's exerting. Why not security? If we don't know the state of our systems, we can never know when they've been compromised, or maybe even that they are burning. Everything is rosy when nothing bad is going on, but how do we harden a cluster to be resistant to an attacker that has already broken in? Everything public facing is in a container, so we want to make our containers as difficult to pivot out of as possible. We also need to lock down APIs, access to data stores, so even a compromised system does not give up access easily. This gives us more time to detect the attack and shut it down. To digress onto security for a moment, a point in time pen test is limited in value. And if subsequent changes to the infrastructure cannot be reasoned about, easily managed or audited by engineers, then a pen test is nothing but a point in time rubber stamp. Continuous security techniques continually verify the state of all infrastructure and provide continued confidence in the state of the system. And we're going to go deep in this talk. If you don't know Kubernetes security too well, I hope you will do after this. So, how secure is Kubernetes? Is it safe to run a multi-tenanted workload? Is it safe to run in a public cloud, on a Raspberry Pi, in a safe somewhere? Can we really run Google-style multi-tenanted infrastructure securely? And how do we make sure that what's safe today stays secure tomorrow and persist configuration across cluster rebuilds? So, what we will talk about, common pones, how to harden Kubernetes, uh, what multi-tenancy looks like, and continuous security. Uh, so, I, I will whiz through this section, um, just in, uh, with a view to time, but back in the day, the kubelet was insecure. Um, there's an argument to say Kubernetes is, is insecure by default. Security fails to keep up with the pace of feature delivery, as in most software packages, and we end up in a state where we have problems like this. The default service account up until Kubernetes 1.6 had root permissions on the API server and was mounted by default into any pod, turning an arbitrary remote, remote code execution into a full cluster compromise. Use RBAC or pay the price. Uh, this is a great talk from Jesse Frizzell about securing applications with SecComp. If you're not using the syscall whitelisting facilities that the kernel offers, uh, you're missing out on a significant level of policy, uh, of extra granular policy. Uh, this is another great talk from Brad Giesemann on misconfigurations and insecurities of the Kubernetes control plane. He went through a load of vendor-backed or supplied distributions, uh, worked with vendors to patch the, uh, the vulnerabilities that he found, and then months later published this talk after everything was responsibly disclosed and patched. Um, of course, like everything in security, it is all about staying up to date. Helm has had security problems. It was only um, TLS lockable um, since, uh, well, effectively from 272. There are exploits with the gRPC endpoints being insecure where any application can talk to Helm and deploy anything it likes, which of course, is if that is uh, a privileged pod, which makes a reverse shell back out to an endpoint controlled by an attacker. Again, it's game over. And the big kahuna, um, Tesla's Monero mining. Low, pre low CPU, probably low returns, but embarrassing for a company that's uh, weaponizing autonomous vehicles. Uh, 
and recently a mount point breakout via a sim link. This was probably sat in the Kubernetes code base since close to day zero. Uh, essentially, this means path traversal from a pod's mount point is not bounded and could go to, for example, your uh, host root user's private keys. Um, here we are. So the HTTP uh, port 8080, in fact, sorry, this is not this slide. Uh, the point being here is that uh, Kubelet has a number of configuration options that are, um, again, insecure by default. Uh, we will go through these in detail, and I'll point them out to you. So why, why continuous security could be a foil to this style of deployment? Well, it's infrastructure as code mixed with continuous delivery mixed with policy and audit, everything, everything defined as code, everything with uh, an effective cryptographic trail back to the person who GPG signed their commit, pushed it through a pipeline, triggering various different jobs, gating with four eyes on the pull request. Uh, th these are all very much within the realms of achievability right now, but we require some glue to actually enforce these things end to end. Uh, so, with a view to continuously deploying and securing, Let's look at hardening the Kubernetes control plane. So this is the control plane uh, and some nodes, a diagram from Lucas Kaldstrom, the 18-year-old uh, maintainer of the Kube ADM project. And as you can see, there is a lot of component intercommunication. Importantly for us, the API server is the single point of truth, etcd being the source of truth, and the API server being the only, only thing that should be communicating mutating or reading any state from etcd. So minimum viable security is TLS everywhere. It's kind of obvious, Kubernetes does it very nicely with client certificates, therefore mutual authentication, so we know the identity of both the caller and, or the provider and the consumer. Um, it is hard to trust any Kubernetes installation entirely, uh, but this certainly is the primary prerequisite. Bootstrapping TLS, this saves us from baking certificates into our base images when we run an immutable infrastructure style Kubernetes cluster and we want to auto scale. What this means is that we can check for the presence of a cube config. If one is not there, we can generate a CSR, a certificate signing request, send it back to the API server, which at this point is at least TLS, so we know the identity of the API server, but we currently don't have an identity as the node. That CSR includes our identifying information on the network, um, IP or DNS based, and then that is signed by the API server and returned to us, and we then have bootstrapped our authentication, um, and from that point on, we're able to securely communicate with the API server. So we can now dynamically add nodes to a Kubernetes cluster. This is super useful. Um, RBAC, of course, we should be enabling RBAC. Um, anybody who's tried to audit RBAC policies uh, probably realizes how annoyingly difficult this is. Kubernetes does not denormalize users in any meaningful way. If we're backed off to an LDAP or an AD integration, then the cluster roles are the only point that we have to identify what people should be doing on our cluster. These sort of things should be, again, driven from version control. Changes should be audited by somebody with a view to the security changes um, that are included, and we can also go some way to testing these things and monitoring for violations. Uh, this is the binding between the three. Um, right, so external authentication for the API server is part of RBAC by removing um, any possibility of the, uh, the very basic token-based auth being uh, running in the server. We federate off to a third, uh, third party identity provider, and that, of course, should be centralized across the whole organization because who's going to offboard a user from your Kubernetes cluster unless it's dealt with by a dedicated team? These problems perhaps only become apparent at a certain size, but I would strongly recommend doing it very early. There are some great tools. As with everything Kubernetes, the community is vibrant and has produced a hell of a lot in here. Uh, CoreOS's DEX is a favorite. So, disabling legacy authorization on GKE. This is, of course, important. Uh, the insecure port, this comes up by default on 8080, and is as it says. It's an insecure port based on the assumption that local network access to the kubelet is the security boundary that we're placing around this. Uh, this is not a good idea at all. This should always, always be disabled. Otherwise, you can make calls like this. 
Uh, on the local host, if you do manage to get a compromise, which is a non-root user, you still have access to the loopback adapter on local host. And here we're just making everything um, on the API server is of course just a RESTful endpoint. And here we're just seeing, uh, oh, what's the first secret? And then we've immediately got a, a juicy service count out in there. Uh, anonymous authentication, this may not seem like it leaks much information, but actually that will leak your Kubernetes version on the public internet and you can scrape the GC, uh, GKE address ranges for this information. Uh, I've noticed that GKE do not consider this, um, well, do not consider this a vulnerability by default to have uh, remediated it just yet. Um, and of course, that etcd cluster contains the keys to the kingdom. Literally everything is stored in there. All state mutations and all the read operations go through the API server back onto etcd. If you were using Calico uh, and COPS, for example, um, until fairly recently, you had no option but to allow Calico to talk directly, directly to etcd unencrypted. That is a bad look and will cause problems. They now have a solution called Typher, which if you look at the way um, the, the container network interface plugins are dealt with on GKE, they now use a Typher proxy, which proxies those requests to etcd straight to the API server. Um, so that is fixable. I would recommend investigation if you find yourself uh, as one of the many, many people running COPS um, with that configuration. And of course, etcd, while it provides client certificates for authentication, does nothing with the data when persisted on disk. Uh, this was the case for a long time. The Kubernetes Secrets API is exactly the same as the config map API, and notably was just base64 encoding secrets at rest, um, which in fact was a requirement to, to place them in. So that was the only boundary um, for someone to overcome when they gained access to the disk with the etcd data persisted on it. We can now work around this. Um, I may be jumping ahead of myself ever so slightly. Uh, this is about rotating keys in general. Um, there are now etcd, ex there's an experimental encryption provider, which will come up in a later slide, which allows us to place a symmetric key onto the API server that is used to encrypt all the data that the API server writes into etcd. So consequently, we can now encrypt that um, both at transit and in rest, uh, in rest and at transit, other way. Anyway, uh, we can encrypt those things and, uh, and we now have a security story for etcd. However, it is not enabled by default and currently um, only something like Docker Enterprise actually does this very nicely, uh, deals with that key and rotates it for you. Otherwise, you have to configure that yourself and I highly recommend doing so. Another note on that, Istio, if you run it, rotates its TLS certificates every hour, which is more than a gold standard. That is gilt-edged and diamond-encrusted. Uh, right, on to securing workloads. Containers form the basis of the Kubernetes security model. We know this. I hope everybody recognizes these kernel primitives. Uh, th these are the mechanisms that we use for layering defense in depth on our running workloads and on some of the control plane components. There are still some non-namespaced resources in, uh, in the Linux kernel. The system time, the kernel key ring, the audit log, DNS, devices, some of the contents of proc. So while we have a namespace story for a lot of things, most notably the user namespace, it's never enabled by default. It's not enabled by default in Docker. Kubernetes does not use it at all. And this means that things like discretionary access control, which is the basis for file system access and users, everything is a file in Linux, of course, including devices, etc. So not having that granularity and the, uh, the full story there means we have some edge cases to work around and these sort of things are exposed by things like the mount symlink traversal bug because we're relying on different non-kernel based tooling. The solution to that unfortunately is still probably five years away while we wait for somebody to take the synthetic benchmark performance hit of who actually does that check to see who owns what? Is it the kernel? Is it the block device? Is it the file system? Uh, I'm holding out for the file system. Maybe we'll get something uh, referred to as a shift file system, which performs that user mapping for a request as they pass through it. However, if that inode is bind mounted into various different namespaces, immediately the scale and the complexity of the problem becomes clear. So um, I, I thank whoever finally ships that into the kernel. It is certainly not happening now, despite a few attempts. 
So, back to pods. The lowest addressable Kubernetes runtime component. Privileged pods have de facto root access to the host. They are the biggest foot gun in Kubernetes. Do not run them if you can avoid it. There are certain control play components, now that Kubernetes self-hosts itself, that require privileged access. This includes the container network interface plugins because they are mutating rules and they are using capabilities um, on sub 1024 ports that unfortunately require more access than uh, we would hope. But there are lots of things that a pod can do to break out of the container security pod model. Running as root inside the container because of the lack of user namespaces maps to the root user outside the container. Now this is a semi-conceptual problem that maybe doesn't become so problematic until you actually have a malicious user running as root inside there. OpenShift will not let you run anything as root inside the container. It uses an admission controller to prevent you doing so, and I hope that feature gets ported back into Kubernetes like so much of the other OpenShift security work that they've done. We can also add excess capabilities. We can um, run without setcomp. We can open things up with RBAC. We can mount host volumes. We can share the PID, the network, or the IPC namespaces that potentially give us access to other things on the host. Um, of course, I've written a tool to uh, try and deal with that. It's called KubeSec, and it performs static analysis on pod definitions and gives you some human readable JSON back to say, in this case, uh, and, and also uh, a list of the reason for all of these being um, security vulnerabilities or dangerous in some way. Uh, and this tool will give you an insight into what you're running and why. And you can see here, for example, privileged containers, unrestricted host access, uh, security context run as non-root is the advice here, because if we set a pod security policy to prevent that from happening, um, we find ourselves in a position where administrator cannot deploy a pod that runs as root. Um, okay, so uh, pod security policies, of course, um, uh, it occurs to me that I, I slightly misdescribed something a moment ago. Um, so, so the OpenShift model is actually to move users into a random, to randomly generate a user uh, in the sort of 30K user ID range. Um, of course, we can set uh, runners non-root in here as per the previous slide. Um, this is uh, the reference, in my opinion, pod security policy from Tim Altler, who works on these things at Google, has an amazing document out on the pod sandbox isolation model, which I highly recommend you search for. Um, he has done and is uh, part of a group that is doing a huge amount of thinking around these attacks. So resource linting, also Gareth Rushgrove has a great tool for running unit tests on YAML, essentially. Okay, so deployments. Uh, this young lady is deploying herself apace into the middle distance. Look at that. Congratulations to her for having more guts than me. Um, right. Now, labels. How interesting are labels? <laughs> Probably not particularly, but they're one of the magic things, let's say, that, uh, that underpins Kubernetes and was part of the learning that the Google team got from uh, trying to take Borg to a mega, learning a lot of lessons, and then just rolling it back into Borg. Um, Importantly, selectors provide a, a bizarre but really useful security feature. As I said before, for a process to bind to a port beneath 1024 is considered a privileged operation and it's bound by the cap net bind. Uh, it's not quite the right permission, but one of these capabilities. That would mean doing what Nginx or Apache does, starting as root, binding to ports 80 and 443, and then dropping permissions and privileges for the forked processes that it uses to serve the HTTP requests. This is not the best idea because you still, uh, you can't use the pod security policy runners non root for example. So, services security feature is to allow us to transparently map, in this case, port 8443 to the services port 443, which means that I only need to address my service via HTTPS service name and that it's transparently rewritten to port 8443 on the pods matching the selectors for this service. It's a super nice feature. Uh, it's, it's not really spoken about, but I would highly recommend that this is, uh, this is done, and then we bind our applications to port 8443 and do not have to worry about the privilege of starting a container and binding to a sub-24 port. Uh, there's some good stuff about service counts. Admission controllers have a lot of detail in these slides, and I will gloss over these for now, but suffice to say, this is what happens when you receive an, a RESTful call from a client. First of all, 
We deal with the API uh, HTTP handling, it gets unbundled, we authenticate and authorize the request, then we mutate, and mutating admission controllers include things like default service count. This means I submit a pod or deployment or whatever, they get broken down and submitted as pods to the admission controllers, and that pod has no service count in its YAML manifest. The service account mutating webhook will say, well, if I'm configured, I will just drop the default service count in there, and this is kind of a hang, uh, an echo through history of the way that Google believed things should be done internally at Borg, which is that everything should have an identity and therefore a service count, whereas for most of our applications, we don't operate at a Google scale, and that default service count provided many years of insecurity instead. Anyway, we have the mutation, a mutating admission controller, we validate the schema of the object, and then finally we run the validating admission webhooks. They will be doing things like enforcing pod security policies. So if we're running as root, then that admission controller will say, no way, Jose, we get a fail, um, and then that bubbles back up to the uh, calling user. If all things are well and good, and everything has been validated, then all the API server does is persist that call to etcd, at which point the scheduler and controller manager are polling etcd for structs in various different states, with nodes, without nodes, various states of initialization, and thus you have the sort of distributed asynchronous nature of the control plane. Uh, it, it's very elegant for what it's worth. Um, we can now run extensible admission controllers, which means that we can put a webhook with uh, a predefined, th 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 opinionatedly highly secure, so you have to put the public key of the, uh, the target certificate that you're submitting to, because ultimately, even though we shouldn't do so, environment variables in YAML can leak information. They should only be used for non-secure uh, things, entities, and information. But ultimately, there is, uh, there is an angle here which is now used by tools like Twistlock and Aqua and image scanning tools to say, I will not allow this um, this image, in fact, into this cluster unless it passes these under, um, under one major CVE, for example. Um, there's also some super exciting stuff here happening around tools such as Graphius and Intoto, which are cryptographic signing and metadata analysis that are all based upon the immutable pod, art, uh, sorry, immutable image artifact, and then we can trace back the provenance of that image again to the user who committed the GPG signed um, a bit of code or dependency update or whatever it is. Um, yeah, lots of interesting stuff coming in here. Lots of stuff on admission control that I will not go to, uh, not go into. Um, you'll probably recognize some of these. There are a huge amount of uh, permissions allocated by default to the system node cluster role. Um, and this node restriction admission controller is actually super cool. Uh, used in combination with a couple of other things, it will prevent nodes from requesting secrets for pods that they're not running. So it goes some distance to pr protecting a cluster from a malicious kubelet. Now that story is far from complete and actually very difficult to achieve, but uh, this, this is a useful step. Uh, pod security policy we've spoken about briefly, it's just an admission controller. Again, we've mentioned these admission controllers um, in GKE, the validating admission webhook. Um, of course, 111 came out yesterday, um, and the state of that may, may not be in beta anymore. Uh, that has changed a fair bit since the initial implementation anyway. Here we are with the etcd encryption. This experimental encryption provider config is paramount. You really must run it. There is uh, there's nothing I hope you leave with that's more important than ensuring that the cluster state is encrypted at rest, because that cluster state may well include your cloud provider account keys, and uh, need I say more. Uh, there's lots of things to help us with this, actually. There's um, Plenty of useful tooling here. One of the ones I like is the Bitnami Sealed Secrets. This is, uh, it works very nicely in a GitOps workflow, and essentially what happens is the Sealed Secrets controller generates a key uh, uh, inside the cluster. We use that outside the cluster to encrypt our secrets. We commit them to a Git repository. Hear me out. They are then encrypted and go, uh, when they're pushed to the cluster, uh, a custom resource definition type uh, is listened to by the controller, which then decrypts them and writes them into the appropriate namespace. So it is secure transport for secrets inside the cluster, which combined with the GitOps model means that you don't give anybody right access to the cluster, and instead you have a controller pulling in from a Git repo of some description. 
Super nice pattern, again, still stabilizing and becoming more mature, but I would recommend uh, you investigate those things if you haven't seen them. This is, again, it's super cool. Uh, token request APIs are one-time tokens. Uh, I won't go into that much more. Compliance, there's loads of stuff around this. These are all relatively self-explanatory. Um, suffice to say, the, uh, the Cubebench CIS scanning stuff from Aqua is very difficult to get a, um, a top score on. Uh, and then, of course, we have all these image scanners. Uh, CoreOS Claire now with Red Hat, of course. Uh, TLA being a really nice integration to prevent you from having to manually post those image layers individually to TLA, which is, uh, which is the way that that works. So, networking in Kubernetes is complicated. Uh, abstraction upon abstraction upon indirection. Um, the only thing I'd recommend is to full, uh, fully understand the networking technology that's being used, be it BGP, Ethernet-based, VXLAN, um, various encapsulation at various layers. There is a lot going on. Um, network policy is only supported by a small subset. I have five minutes to go, so please forgive me if I start blurring words into one another. Uh, this is um, network policy. So it's denied by default. It's failed closed. I really don't like this. It's effect effectively a wild card. I understand why it's failed closed, but it's a poor user experience. Uh, this is a network policy denying everything but egress on port 53 for TCP and UDP. And uh, DNS is not permissible. That is because DNS resolution is non-deterministic and there may be global uh, load balancing, there may be DNS round robin. Um, this is forbidden. You cannot put a DNS name in a pod selector. The recommended pattern is to place a reverse proxy on the perimeter of your network segment and use that to resolve. Service meshes, I love service meshes. Istio's damn cool. Uh, what is a service mesh? Well, I'm, I'm sure people here probably know better than the average. Um, yeah, it's very nice. Uh, thank you for Envoy. Plenty of stuff in here. I mean, that's... Uh, yeah, so of course, this year networking performs some of the same functions as network policy does. It will give you point-to-point -point RBAC. Um, it is essentially a zero-trust networking model because we authenticate and authorize every single request with mutual TLS. That is bootstrapped by Spiffy, who are having a community day this afternoon, if you're interested. Spiffy has just been integrated in HashiCorp's console a Hashi days two days ago. That means console and Istio can theoretically communicate because Spiffy is used as the identity framework. Again, super cool, not the content of this talk. Um, we built another tool because actually testing network policies is uh, a special form of hell reserved, presumably, for me. Um, what this means is we aggressively parallelize Nmap, we attach to the same network namespace as the component under test, and we make outbound requests with Nmap based upon, which to all intents and purposes appear to be coming from the same application because they're in the same network namespace. Um, Works like this, slightly da, uh, nice tap output. Cloud native dynamic firewalls, plenty of different options there. Right, I'm gonna be on time, <laughs> possibly. So let's recap. Actually, we're not gonna be on time, we're only halfway through. So we've secured the control plane, the applications, and the network. So with all those things configured, we can consider multi-tenancy. Uh, yes, so. Um, CoreOS, which is now being folded into, uh, which Tectonic is now being folded into um, uh, OpenShift. There is a fork of it from our friends at Kimvolk. There are plenty of other minimal attack surface host distributions, which are strongly recommended. Of course, immutable infrastructure. So th the difficulty here is really multi-tenancy is hard, and providing firm, hard boundaries between things is, uh, is even more difficult when everything's software. It is possible, but you have to be very careful not to step outside the constraints. Um, we do not want to allow any routes to any of these things and plenty more because access to these things across the network can again lead to an escalation on the node which can break our security boundary. We do not want our pods to be able to talk to our cloud provider metadata APIs because we may have instance roles. We, uh, we may be able to gather metadata from the user data and the bootstrap of these servers which can be used to further pivot throughout the infrastructure. Uh, soft multi-tenancy appears to be missing what is probably a picture of cute kittens, I'm very apologetic to tell you. Um, so, we want to isolate by namespace, and we have to assign these limits as well. The limit ranges um, are the uh, CPU and resource quotas that we can apply on a per pod basis, but we can segment namespaces in the same way. Um, having physical separation of nodes uh, is actually part of a hard multi-tenancy. 
Um, and of course, we should not let anything onto our clusters that does not, uh, that has not been through our pipeline and does not have our, our supply chain security guarantees. So ideally audited and uh, with eyes upon them. Admission controllers and of course, everything is code. The GitOps stuff that I've been belaboring throughout this is, uh, is linked in there. Really great article from Alexis Richardson, the, the chairman of the CNCF. Strongly recommended. Hard multi-tenancy. This is when all users are untrusted and potentially malicious. I will have to whiz through this because I'm more or less at time. Um, but importantly here, segregate logically by application type and physically where possible. Separate node pools of different tenants. Despite the levels of security we can add to all these things, it really is important to base everything on defense and depth, assume that we're running untrusted malicious workloads and play through the thought experiment of what happens when a container breakout occurs. It's pretty rare, but all hypervisors and most current uh, um, container runtime interface um, runtimes have been broken out of. Although that's not entirely true with some of the new ones. Here we go, we've got a lovely list of interesting things here. The virtual cube basically allows anything that conforms to its interface to pretend that it's a, a Kubernetes kubelet. Super cool, um, very exciting thing out of Microsoft from Brendan Burns. Uh, of course, Cat Containers is now using the Intel uh, VTX virtualization extensions to run VMs as containers, so we've now come full circle, and we can treat things that we trust less, um, or maybe that require greater segregation uh, with uh, different runtime um, yes, so hard multi-tenancy, kind of said a few things here. Dan Walsh, um, we trust as the Oracle. And of course, once we've run all these things, then we should probably be running intrusion detection, like the kitty. Um, all these guys sell stuff. They all have um, their own uh, different profiles. We've spoken about RBAC briefly. We can auto-generate RBAC based on Kube Control Audit Logs. Super cool tool. Uh, makes development of RBAC profiles very easy indeed. Um, audit logs in GKE are by default turned on, um, so we can audit everything, but of course we don't want to audit the request or response body of a secrets call. So again, GKE has super sane defaults for these, I recommend you have a look. Those are audit logs going through. Um, and then of course, um, we have lots of different ways to build images. My favorite thing here is actually uh, Umochi, which is from an um, Australian dude called Alexa Sarai, who is also running the Rootless Containers project, uh, inspired a lot of work that Jesse did. He's been shipping features into the kernel and into Run C and fixing Golang bugs uh, related to this for the last few years, and uh, we owe him a huge debt of gratitude. Um, of course, continuous security again involves cats, um, the gatekeeper here. The relentless focus on automation allows engineers to automate and refine the business's concerns. Veracity, security, and performance in some order. Security is the greatest advantage yielded by this approach. It's what slows down teams, and it's what ultimately, as, uh, as Ticketmaster has now shown us in the last few days, I hope they get hit with GDPR. That'll be very interesting. Um, as, yeah, as, as these things have demonstrated, then security is difficult and very difficult to, uh, to do consistently. And I must caveat that by saying it was a third party involved there, not Ticketmaster themselves. So, continuous self-validation, more robust pipelines, and it leaves penetration testers free to do the actually more difficult stuff. They're not turning up and running Nessus or a prearranged set of script kiddie-esque scripts. They're actually doing meaningful investigation into your configuration and how you've set up your, uh, your applications. So, don't get caught out. Be proactive and preempt what's coming. <laughs> oh, poor guy. Mm. And with that, there is a hugely expanded attack surface now with Kubernetes. It gives us intense velocity and so many more opportunities, but it is insecure by default and is not set up in a way that is conducive to easy security. These things are fixable, but we have to run assertions in our pipelines. We have to be careful about how we're shipping changes to these systems, and we have to ensure that not only the perimeter, but also the interpod networking and the control plane networking is secure and stays secure. There's loads of new security primitives to learn about, which is interesting, if not a bit scary, because of course, new code has a highest potential for security vulnerabilities, and we really must test these things. Security testing keeps you young. Thank you for your attention.
Thank you. Who has a question for Andrew? Where? Yes, absolutely. Yeah, I'll, I'll tweet the slides immediately. And uh, yeah, apologies for the intense speed. Thank you. Any other questions? Over there in the back. Can you catch it? Hi. Uh, Hi. Do you know what is the impact of a considerable amount of network policies <coughs> in the performance of communication between pods? Um, I can answer this by dodging the question. Uh, because container network, um, sorry, because network policies are implemented by the container network interface plugin, then it's plugin dependent. So th there's that list of a few. Um, ultimately, most of these things boil down to an intensely uh, complex and painful set of IP tables rules. Container networking is just IP tables. Now, Cilium changes that because it's baking in IBPF, uh, eBPF. Um, 111 is shipping a Q proxy switch out with IPVS, which is uh, in kernel um, load balancing. But ultimately, everything else is IP tables, and so you're getting the performance of net filter for most of these things, basically. Thank you. Any other questions? No? Okay. Thank you very much, Andrew. Thanks. <laughs>